Okay, this will be lecture six of chapter four, Money and Inflation. This will be the final lecture for the chapter, and we want to talk just a little bit more about the money demand function. So from that Keynesian liquidity preference framework, we get this basic demand for liquidity, or demand for money, that we're going to call um, demand for real balances, where it's a function of interest rates and income, where that this demand for real balances is negatively related to um, interest rates and positively related to income. So we want to take this just a step further. When people are deciding whether to hold money or bonds, they don't know what the inflation rate turns out to be. And so we're going to plug in this formula, this Fisher equation for the x ex ante real interest rate. Now notice that this comes straight from the Fisher equation because, well, the Fisher equation gives us that the real interest rate equals the nominal interest rate minus expected inflation. We solve that for the nominal interest rate and, well, we get this relationship here. The nominal interest rate equals the real interest rate plus expected inflation. Okay, so we're going to add that layer to our money demand function. So in equilibrium, we have this relationship. The supply of real balances equals the demand for real balances. So let's take this apart and figure out, well, what happens when we change variables? First of all, M. What's going on? M is, an ex is exogenously determined by the Federal Reserve, or whoever the monetary authority is. That's the, ultimate, the overall nominal money supply. R adjusts to ensure that savings equals investments, so that we have equilibrium within the investment market. Y is determined by the fixed level of inputs and technology. All right, we're, this goes back to chapter 3. R goes back to chapter 3. Y goes back to chapter 3. P adjusts to ensure that we have this equilibrium in this money market, or equilibrium in, between money supply and money demanded. So for given values of the real interest rate, real income, and expected inflation, a change in M causes P to change by the same percentage. All right? This is just like the quantity theory. So while we looked all the way back and we said, well, the quantity theory looks a little, a little simplistic right, for the money demand function, it's still, even in a little more complex, a little more rich model, which admittedly I think is, is a better model because it includes interest rates, includes that price of money, we still get a prediction that's very similar to the prediction we got from the quantity theory demand function. So what about expected inflation? Over the long run, people don't consistently over or underestimate forecasted inflation. So it's kind of like this. You can fool me once, you can fool me twice, but you're probably not going to keep on fooling me forever. Eventually, people say, well, wait a minute. No, I've been guessing too high for the last three years. I think I'm going to lower my guess. Um, or I've been guessing too lows for a while, so I think I'm going to raise my guess. So on average, our expectations of inflation should roughly equal actual inflation. In the short run, expected inflation may change when people get new information. Okay. So example, the Fed announces it will increase M next year. People expect the price of uh, next year's price level to be higher, so expected inflation rises. Why? Because we know that if M goes up, what happens? Price goes up in, in accordance to. Right? Okay, and so we expect an increase in inflation. This affects P now, even though M hasn't changed yet. Now this is something to remember. There's, so there's a couple of things to get out of this. First of all, that the expectation of a, a variable, changing the expectations of a variable, can sometimes be more important to our decision-making processes than what actually happens to that variable. And we can see here that a policy announcement 
that hasn't even taken effect yet may have an effect on variables in the macro economy right now. So the Fed announces it will increase policy sometime in the future, and that has effects now because it alters people's expectations. Okay, so this is a very important thing to take into account, especially when we um, get to the policy um, chapters and we want to do a little more analysis of, of macroeconomic policy. So, how does price level respond to changes in expected inflation? Well, first of all, we're going to hold the real interest rate, output, and the money supply fixed, the nominal money supply fixed. We're going to hold all those constant, and we just want to change one variable at a time. This is a very important point, too. Oftentimes, you get questions on quizzes. You could uh, get other questions where it asks you to change something, and then you want to change other variables, too, because it makes sense that those other variables would change at the same time. We'll resist that temptation. We only want to try to change one variable at a time and see what happens. Eventually, we'll want to change one variable, see what happens, and then see what that effect has on changing other variables. But for right now, one step at a time. Let's just see what happens to a change in expected inflation holding the other variables fixed. So if the expected inflation goes up, what happens? By the Fisher effect, we know nominal interest rates go up. So essentially, we look here, we're saying we're going to hold that guy fixed, that guy fixed, and that guy fixed. Well, if R stays fixed and um, the expected inflation rate goes up, what's got to happen to R plus the expected inflation rate? It has to go up. All right. So that's why that I goes up. All right. Because remember, what did we do? We replaced the nominal interest rate with the Fisher equations representation to put the real interest rate in there. So nominal interest rates go up. If nominal interest rates go up, what's going to happen? We're going to demand less money. So money demand will decrease. And in order to reestablish this equilibrium between money supply and money demand, price must rise. Why? Because price goes up in order to make this whole fraction go down. And since money demand fell, the actual supply of real balances need to fall. Since M is fixed, we only have price to change. And so a decrease in money demand holding money supply constant, the nominal money supply constant, will lead to an increase in price level. Okay, so that concludes our discussion of Chapter 4, despite what the, um, it says at the bottom there, Chapter 4, Money and Inflation.